Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. This is an exploring research seminar called Recipes for Early Modern Beauty. And I'm Patricia Akimi. I'll be chairing this session. My pronouns are she, her, and I'll start with a brief audio description of myself for anyone who would find it useful. I have glasses on, I have curly hair, it's mostly gray at this point. I've got a gray and black sweater on. Uh, and I'm talking to you from Washington, DC, where I am the director of the Folger Institute at the Folger Shakespeare Library. And let me say today that um, we at the Folger have a fantastic collection of recipes, which are germane to the topic of today's um, panel. So if you have never been to the Folger and that falls within your interest area, please think about coming to join us here and know that our fellowship program is available and uh, applications are due in December. So let me tell you about the Welcome Collection. For those who are not familiar, the Welcome Collection is a free museum and library that aims to challenge how we think and feel about health by connecting science, medicine, life, and art. Welcome is a global charitable foundation that supports science to solve the urgent health challenges facing everyone. And today's event is part of a program of events called Exploring Research that are intended to platform current and topical research that has been based around the collections at Welcome. A little bit of housekeeping for today. Before we get started, I'm going to run through how we will do this event. This event is being live streamed and it'll be available to watch again on the Welcome Collections YouTube channel. Uh, your cameras and microphones will be off, but hopefully you can hear us and see us. There is live speech to text available and there is a link to access these if you need them in the chat the uh, event will feature three 15 to 20 minute presentations by our speakers, Jill Burke, Haley O'Kell, and Romana Samern. And there will be an audience Q&A with the remaining time. You can engage in this interactive event. Um, we would love to hear from you during and after the talk. So you can chat, you can comment, and you can ask questions for the Q&A throughout in the YouTube chat. And the chat moderator will compile those for us and will answer all those we have time for. You do need to be signed into YouTube to chat there. And an important note, this is intended to be a safe space. We want everyone to have a positive experience. And so please interact as responsibly and respectfully as you can. If you are online and you are struggling with the platform in any way, or you have a question, please comment in the chat box and our welcome collection moderators will get in touch. You will need to have a YouTube login to use the chat function again. I'm going to briefly introduce our three speakers today and then we'll turn to the presentations. So we are going to hear from three speakers, the first of whom is Jill Burke. Professor um, Jill Burke is Chair of Renaissance Visual and Material Cultures at the University of Edinburgh. She has published widely on the history of art, gender, and the body. She is currently Principal Investigator of a Royal Society funded project, Renaissance Goo, working with a soft matter scientist to remake 16th century cosmetics and skincare recipes. She was on the curatorial team of the Renaissance Nude exhibition at the J. Paul Getty Museum and the Royal Academy, London, 2018 to 2019. And her first book, Changing Patrons, questions the motivations behind Italian Renaissance art patronage. And her second, The Italian Renaissance Nude, was nominated as a choice outstanding academic title in 2019. Haley O'Kell, was recently examined for her PhD at the University of Leeds, her research funded by the White Rose College of the Arts and Humanities. Her, her doctoral research in, investigates early modern Iberian women's agency in the realms of beauty, fashion, finance, and law. She has received several awards and grants, traveling to Spain frequently as part of her research. And recently she undertook a project working with Wellcome Collection to demonstrate the research potential of their Spanish manuscripts. 
and Romana Samarin. Dr. Samarin is Elise Richter Fellow of the Austrian Science Fund at the Institute of Art History at the University of Salzburg, and she is coordinator of the academic program of Figurations of Transition and Inter-University Cooperation between the University of Salzburg and University Mosarteum. Her Research focuses on early modern art and knowledge with an emphasis on the convergence of body, image, and medicine. And she is working on her second book on cosmetics and art, 1500 to 1800. I'm so pleased to welcome all three of these speakers today. And let's begin with Jill Burke's presentation. Jill, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And it's uh, delightful to be here. Um, I have uh, hopefully got about 20 minutes um, uh, to talk um, about um, my re most recent research. And I thought I'd start with um, some research that's actually on show at the Welcome at the moment in the Cult of Beauty exhibition. I worked as a part of, uh, I'm, as, as Patricia said, I'm the director of a research project called Renaissance Goo. And as part of that, we worked um, with the curators at the Welcome and a design team, um, the wonderful Baum and Leahy, uh, to make um, an installation called the Renaissance Sensorium. And one of the reasons behind this is that normally when we encounter history, we encounter it through words, we encounter it verbally, we read books, we might hear lectures like this one, or sometimes we see objects. I've worked as an art historian for a long time, but these are objects generally that we can see, but we can't touch. So the sense of sight tends to dominate our understanding of the past. Whereas, of course, we're talking about past lives, our ancestors that were experienced in multifarious ways. And this is particularly true if you're working with recipes as a source and if you're working on cosmetics, which might be about changing the way that someone's lo someone looks, but also have properties that are really important, like properties of feeling, say, moisturizer on your skin or, or, or conditioner on your hair. It's the it's way that they feel that's most important or the smell of many different cosmetics and perfume or even the sound of making um, these uh, recipes at home um, is a multi-sensory uh, is a multi-sensory um, uh, subject and and the renaissance sensorium uh, which i'm showing you a picture of this uh, uh, at the moment is an important um it's, it's an attempt to kind of communicate those senses um without using words in a non-verbal way so can we have the next slide? I'm just going to show you a few more shots of this. Um, so uh, working with a soft matter scientist really made me think about the viscosity of liquids, which hadn't been something I thought about before, but which is actually fundamental to the way that most skincare works. So uh, in the Renaissance, um, skincare was divided up and, and uh, medical um, substances also were divided up by viscosity. And that's how we've shown the exit, um, how the insulation works as well. Can we go to the next slide? So I'll show you, there's five substances uh, that we've made for this installation. And the lower right hand side, you'll see a glass vessel with uh, what looks like water inside, and that's rose water. This was ubiquitous um, substance in the Renaissance all over Europe. People both bought it from shops and made it at home. Next to that in the middle is mastic oil. Again, um, this was uh, a recipe, this was used for a, as a sun cream in the Renaissance as a sunscreen to stop um, people either getting tanned or um, getting burnt. And in the middle, there's a gel um, that's used as a hair conditioner, leave-in conditioner made from mallow and psyllium seeds. And we made all these substances in Edinburgh and brought them down to London for the exhibition. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Um, and this side of the slide, you'll see lots of balls in um, in a net in netting, and I made all those in my kitchen. Uh, 150 soap balls, um, which almost drove me completely crazy. Um, but this is a very typical um, Renaissance cosmetic because you buy the soap. You buy plain soap, you grate it, and then you add um, whatever botanicals you like, whatever kind of scent that you like, maybe musk, maybe rose, maybe violet oil, um, to tweak those recipes to your liking. So this is something that um, is really um, 
emblematic of what a lot of Renaissance women were doing. They might not have been making things from scratch, just like you might not make things from scratch in the kitchen, but they brought things in and then then um, personalised them. Um, also on that slide is the recipe I'm going to talk about today. It's under the um, orangey brown glass dome and it's a recipe for anti-wrinkle cream. Um, and I'll show you, um, next slide please, I'll show you that now. Um, so this anti-wrinkle cream was quite a surprise and I'll talk about why. Um, this is it up close. Um, I, I don't think it's worked that well to get rid of all my wrinkles, but it does actually work as a moisturiser. And this is one of the most surprising things that we found. Uh, next slide, please. All these, I can't think why I didn't tell Patricia also to mention my most recent book. It's available in all good bookstores. Uh, it's called How to Be a Renaissance Woman. Um, and it um, adds to this amazingly new and, and uh, really fertile and vibrant field of the history of cosmetics, which was ignored for a long, long time. And now there's a lot of people doing, as you'll find out, very exciting work on this. Um, this is uh, looks mainly at Italian women um, in the 16th and 17th centuries and looks at their use of cosmetics but also how they thought about beauty as both something good and something bad and how they disagreed about it uh, as a whole as well so that there's that book but at the end of this book there are recipes that have been translated into um, a kind of modern uh, in, into English obviously but also into a, a, a modern format so that you can make them at home and the recipe I'm going to talk about today is there um, tallow and tree gum and your wrinkle cream. Uh, next slide, please. So this recipe I first found in one of my favourite books that I've ever read, uh, Giovanni Marinello's Ornamenti delle Donne, or Ornaments of Women, that was published in 1562 in Venice. And it's not the first book of cosmetics, recipes for women. It's, you know, fairly early but it's certainly not the first and um, the first books that I found in the printed books were from the 1520s um, but Marinello really takes his subject seriously and includes about 1400 recipes that he divides up um, into um, body for bathing and then he looks at the hair then he looks at the face and then he looks at um, different bits of the body bit by bit um, and basically he tells women what's wrong with their bodies and how they can correct them he compares them to um, the beauties of the beautiful women uh, described by poets like Petrarch or, or Ariosto um, and tells them how to achieve that look. Um, a lot of the copies of Marinello have um, writing on them, have commentaries in the margin, have underlining. And this is work that I'm, I'm this is my next article that I'm working on at the moment about readers of beauty books and um, how um, what what it suggests about usage. Next slide, please. So this is the recipe in the book itself. You'll see that this is one of the underlined recipes. It's an easier recipe and it's one of the things I've noticed so far is that the easier recipes tend to be ones that people are underlining, the ones with less esoteric ingredients, perhaps as you'd, you'd maybe expect. Um, and I'll, um, next slide please. And we don't know where Marinello got all his recipes from. Some I've traced to um, and, uh, texts from ancient Rome and Greece that were um, very uh, enthusiastically being republished at this time from um, people like Galen, for example, um, or, or late antique um, versions of these recipes. So some of them he got them are just a textual tradition. But this one wasn't. And I think this one is more likely to be an oral tradition or um, something that's been written down because it's very close to a recipe in a wonderful treatise on cosmetics that is in the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore, um, which basically has the same ingredients. It has tallow from in this in this case from a gelded ram. It's, it has uh, it has egg in it and it has a mastican incense. And in this case, it's for um, um, curing the wrinkles on the stomach after giving birth. So all the elements are the same, but it's not copied from this. Uh, Marino, it's not the same, it's not copied, which suggests that this recipe was circulating in Italy in the early 16th century in a variety of forms. And can I have the next slide, please? The recipe also spread. Uh, Marinello's book was very popular. Um, it was reprinted in Italy three times. It was translated into German, um, and I'm showing you the recipe in the German version. 
Um, it was also, there's a version of it in French, and the French version is the third uh, one along. And eventually, um, over 100 years later, it's translated, there's a version of Marinelle's book in English um, by um, a chap called, um, a doctor called Thomas Jameson. Um, it looks like Jameson got his recipe straight from uh, Marinello as opposed to via the French, which I originally thought that was the case because the French um, version insists on a marble mortar and that's not in the English uh, version. Next slide, please. People didn't necessarily make all these things at home. So when we look at these recipe books, it looks like you should take them home, like we do a cookbook and you should make them. But actually what seems to have happened is that apothecaries would keep copies of these books and the customers who would include women might come along and um, choose um, recipes from these books or ask an apothecary for certain for something and they'd, they'd say it. Or, you know, if you're a wealthier woman, you might have many servants who could make these things for you. Um, or you could sometimes buy them just ready made on the street. So in the second um, image there, there's a man selling specchi e pomata, which means mirrors and pomades. And this um, kind of cream would be counted as a pomade. And so you could buy um, you could buy um, uh, cosmetics ready made as well as these recipe books. Some of the cheaper recipe books are about 24 pages, really thin, and they would cost a few pennies. So they would have been accessible to many different um, levels of society. Next slide, please. Other women made a living by creating these recipes and being what we would think of as hairdressers or beauticians. So this is an image um, from 1528 of um, from a kind of. Uh, um, a, a kind of early early um, travel narrative about Lotsana, who's um, a converted Jewish woman who came to Rome in the early 16th century. And while in Rome, she made a living by plucking eyebrows and by creating some beauty, beauty recipes. And although this is a fictional account, um, there's uh, evidence from court records and other evidence of um, recipe sharing that shows that these women, indeed, who, who made a living from, from um, being beauticians creating recipes, even creating um, hair pieces out of um, real hair to sell on, um, that these women did exist. And it seems that immigrant women were particularly important. Again, there needs to be more work on this. And um, the Spanish tradition, which we're going to hear about Spain later, was really important in Italy um, for, for introducing new uh, recipes um, for cosmetics and, and hygiene. Next slide, please. Um, some women, this is this is just a slide to remind me to say that some women did make these in their home. Um, I think in England it's particularly important. Um, the Accomplished Ladies that Delight, um, a book by Hannah Woolley um, from mid, the mid 17th century, shows um, in these C slides shows uh, women uh, making distilled waters at the top. Um, in the middle shows a woman um, beautifying herself in front of a mirror, and at the bottom shows um, um, women cooking in, kit in the kitchen. So the kitchen is a space of invention in this period for all sorts of things, including, including cosmetics. But there's also women who work professionally. So women seemed particularly associated with distillation. In the 16th century, this is a German image. Um, there's a woman uh, making um, rose water. There's evidence that Italian apothecaries also bought um, their rose water in from women who made it specially. Um, and also um, many women were apothecaries in their own right. This is particularly true in convents um, where you'd have an apprenticeship system just uh, with the nuns learning from each other. And convents could be very important centres in Catholic Europe for the selling of both medicine and kind of cosmetic cleansing waters like rose water, for example. Next slide, please. OK, so that's the background. And you have to imagine when I first started reading Marinello and first time trying to get to grips with these things, there's these 1400 recipes. Some of them contain ingredients that I didn't really want to handle. So a lot of the recipes contain ingredients like urine, for example, um, like feces. I wasn't so keen on having that in my kitchen. Um, so that was something that we ruled out. Other recipes contain ingredients that we now know are toxic. 
Um, this doesn't mean they don't work. So lead white, for example, looks really, really beautiful, um, um, but it's not very good to put on your skin. It gives you lead poisoning. Um, similarly, mercury um, was used in um, skin uh, lightening um, um, preparations and it did work. It's still used in some skin lightening preparations today, although the um, World Health Organization are trying to outlaw it. Um, so these poisons that are often used to kind of laugh at women women were aware they were poisonous but it was worth using them anyway because beauty was such an important um social um property you know it was so useful to be beautiful um for particularly for poorer women in this in this era because it could get you a better husband anyway so we have these recipes there's no way of understanding a recipe like this without making it take a pound of mutton tallow that has been washed nine times in cold water. Why? What? How do you wash fat? Mix this with egg white. Why? Uh, foamed with a pestle in the mortar and with a little butter. Then add some powdered mastic and incense. What does that smell like? Then apply it to the forehead several times. So without making it, you don't know what it sounds like. It sounds like it's going to be a mess because you have egg and you have fat and you have powder. It doesn't sound like it's going to be particularly good. Um, next slide, please. The first thing is take a pound might seem self-evident but it's not um the pound all those translations of take a pound that i've just shown you actually would have been different weights um the venetian pound is about 300 grams um so much less than our our, our current day uh, our present day pound um so even something as that seems straightforward like a weight and it's rare that weights are given in, in this type of recipe often it's just a handful or as much as you like um so a lot of it is is um, trial and error um, next slide, please. Of mutton tallow. Again, why tallow? Why not lard, which is pork fat? Why? Um, what is it about the properties of tallow that make people insist on it? Um, we found comparing it to lard, because I made this with lard and made this with coconut oil, that tallow has a much um, higher um, melting point. So yet lard is more greasy. Tallow is stiffer and more lumpy. Um, but it's less, it, it leaves, it sinks in the skin better. Um, so there's material properties, which mean, make that mean that tallow is desirable, but it also has a longer shelf life. Um, so we left these, um, the, these um, both lard and both tallow mixtures out and the lard became mouldy much more quickly. And this was of course important in a time before refrigeration. Coincidentally, we didn't know that and they couldn't have known this at the time. Um, tallow also contains a lot of um, antioxidants and several vitamins, the kind of things that you'll find in anti wrinkle creams today. So there is perhaps um, also um, questions of eff efficacy. It does make you does really make you smell of sheep, though. Um, and but we'll talk about why, why, how they cover that later on. Next slide, please. Washing nine times is a horrible job. It's very slippy. It, it sticks to your hands. You get everything in the kitchen covered with um, sheep fat. Um, and it's likely that this was both to get rid of blood, but also um, to make the, the tallow more malleable. It's quite stiff. But the heat of your hands um, makes it more usable. And it also incorporates a little bit of water into the, into the recipe. Next slide, please. So mixing with egg whites, it's a bit where it could all go wrong, but actually it makes it makes sure that you, it says you should make egg white into in a mortar. But I cheated and used a fork um, rather than a mortar and pestle and you get it. So it's not quite it. You get it. So it's just loosened and then you beat like crazy to incorporate the egg white into the into the fat. And this is when the magic happens, because what happens is it forms an emulsion. Egg white, if you've ever made mayonnaise, will know that that's basically egg and fat. And if you make it together, it kind of suddenly balloons and forms an emulsion. And this is exactly what's happening with this uh, mixture as well. So the little bits of water all get incorporated into the fat and it turns from this globbly, awful, sticky fat thing into a smooth cream. Um, I have to say one of the things that also we noticed about this recipe is that I lost patience well before a Renaissance woman would with the amount of beating that was needed. Um, I think people's arms were much stronger generally um, carrying around water, doing these repetitive tasks, but also the kind of the um, willingness to do tasks repetitively that we now um, use machines to replicate. Next slide, please. Then the magic bit is crushing the mastic and the incense. 
So frankincense is exactly, you know, if you've been to a, a, a Catholic church, for example, that's the smell, if you can imagine it. And mastic is a similar kind of a lighter smell, a tree gum as well. If you go to the exhibition in London, you'll be able to smell uh, what this mixture smells like. Um, and it's great to mix them. They kind of explode. The scent explodes as you crush them in the mortar. Um, and um, you can, uh, they really effectively, particularly frankincense, really effectively masks the, sh the smell of the sheep. Um, so it does make it all, all less, less sheepy. Um, um, next slide, please. So what we have here is a kind of transformation, none of which I would have known about if I hadn't tried the recipe. It's easy to dismiss the things that you don't know, and, and, and particularly women's attitude to cosmetics in the Renaissance used to, used to be dismissed, still sometimes is, as just rather silly women being interested in vanity. Um, next slide, please. Is that the last one? Yeah. So hopefully, hopefully I've convinced you of the usefulness of trying these cosmetic recipes. What we found out is that there's much more expertise, much more hidden knowledge in these recipes than we actually knew, that women uh, know how to make an, uh, an emulsion, that distillation was commonplace knowledge, um, and that, that this domestic knowledge has been lost. Um, this kind of really, really kind of everyday know-how, but um, making them has shown that there's an interior logic to the recipe. So now, because I've made a few, if you show me a Renaissance cosmetic recipe, I'll be able to say, oh yeah, I've seen something like that um, more often than not. Um, so it's been really helpful for me to read these texts and kind of have an understanding of the logic behind them so I can understand the text better. And finally, it was just a delight to make them and to realise that you can make moisturiser at home. What a great gift these recipes are still giving us. Um, even to say, make rose oil, to find some roses in the garden and to preserve that scent um, for the rest of the year when they're not available in the summer. Um, so, so I hope that that's convinced you this is my that we can experience history in lots of different ways and it doesn't always have to be reading um, and that you can just try something out get things wrong, um, but still learn very much from the process. So thank you. Um, so that's me. Um, and um, I hope, um, who's who's next? Sorry, Patricia. Oh. Who's Hayley? <laughs> Hayley O'Kell, who's done some amazing work, it sounds, on um, on Spain and, and Spanish women and cosmetics. So I'll go with you. Thank you so much, Jill. It was absolutely wonderful to hear your talk because I could see a lot of similarities um, with some of my own work and beginning to look at cosmetics um, and some of the beauty rituals that Spanish and Latin American women had. Um, so I'm really, really honoured to be here with you all today um, to talk about um, beauty regimes specifically in early modern Spain and Latin America, um, which has been a big focus of my PhD thesis, which I recently passed. Um, so the tagline of my talk might have possibly drawn you in. Um, so I mentioned that I was going to be talking about clay eating and Iberian women's habits and um, love of eating um, fired clay, which is quite a unique um, situation and regime um, that they practiced. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I'm actually just going to begin my section by thinking a little bit more about the theory of beauty um, and how beauty works in society. So we know beauty's presence has almost indefinitely been there for centuries upon end. If we think about very early Greek reflections on maybe the sheer untouchable beauty of Helen of Troy, um, you know, if we think about Helen's beauty was valued by a very clear value, a very high value, with a war being conducted in her name due to her beauty, um, we know there's a lot of stake um, with beauty itself. Um, beauty can be quite paradoxical though. Um, we often hear maxims such as beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but what if our pre beholder presupposes an idea of beauty based on both patriarchal and racial values? To be beautiful is not simple and it's certainly not now and it wasn't in early modern Spain and its empire either. And that's what my talk is gonna focus on today. 
So particularly for early modern Spain and Latin America, beauty standards were conditioned by the white, white patriarchy. Um, so some beauty practices did afford some white middle class women a lot of agency and a pleasure in fulfillment. But of course, we have the other side of the spectrum where indigenous women, Mesoamerican women did not get that same agency as they couldn't participate in some trends that called for a certain amount of whiteness. So another key theorist is Immanuel Kant and he tried to give a theoretical background to the concept of beauty and he said that beauty has been conditioned by cultural, social, geographical and temporal factors. Um, there's quite a modern famous um, image, I don't actually have it on this PowerPoint, of a woman being changed by like an AI generator to adhere to the beauty standard in each country, even now. So we can understand and really think about how that beauty standard changed between country and changed between time frame as well. So Kant had this term which he called adherent beauty. And what he meant by that was that beauty already presupposes a concept depending on the country and the region and, and the time frame. And that most often um, individuals, humans, are um, assessed in accordance to these standards. So people had a very clear view for their country and what, what their women should look like. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, some scholars have also argued, so a really, really famous um, book is Naomi Wolf's The Beauty Myth. They've argued that early modern women couldn't possibly have experienced the machinations of the beauty industry as we do now. So, of course, the, what we experience as women now with the advent of technology is possibly a lot more forceful and ubiquitous. Um, if we think about sort of advertising and cookies and adverts targeting us, um, especially as women, um, you know, if you look at a beauty product or you look at a piece of clothing that reappears across your um, social media platforms. But I want to argue that I still believe that those women in the early modern period still felt beauty to be a very significant part of their life. Um, and it wasn't just a part of their life that for example, restricted them. It was actually a part that gave them a lot of agency and a lot of freedom. Um, I think if we say that it's only post the 1830s when we had like photography appear, that is really taken away something from the women that preceded these eras. You know, these women would have saw beauty standards perpetuated in portraits and paintings. Women would have often shared tips and tricks with their friends um, and with one another. We've got... Um, women that use quite toxic ingredients, as Jill mentioned, they were willing to do this because there was clearly something at stake for them in using those ingredients. Um, so it's really important that we know that beauty has always mattered and it's not just a case of a pre and post 1830s when technology really, really came through. If we go on to the next slide, please. So theories on beauty have also shown beauty is being quite closely intertwined with patriarchy but there's a lot of agency involved as well um a lot of women who pursue beauty rituals and beauty regimes um are concerned with a lot of the freedom and the pleasure that it gives themselves if you think about um the sort of nature of being a woman um part of the joy of performing rituals um, on one's body is often for yourself or perhaps for your female friends to um, appreciate. Um, and most often it's not for um, male attention, which I believe is exactly the same case as these early modern women, is there was a very, very special um, community of women that appreciated one another's beauty techniques and how what they did to feel beautiful. Um, so what I'm asking, because I'm going to be talking about quite a toxic um, beauty trend today, is when we're pursuing something quite dangerous and health risking, like these Iberian women did, what did women stand to gain from these practices? Why would these women put their bodies and themselves in danger? There must have been something at stake because these women were very, very intelligent um, and they had a lot of agency in, in the things that they did. So I argue that there must have been something at stake for them that was important. Um, if we could go into the next slide, please. So just before I talk about 
um, very specifically the clay eating that was part of early modern Spain. Um, this is just a little bit of a reflection on another toxic uh, beauty fad that took across Europe in the 18th century. So I think Jill mentioned in her talk about um, white lead. Um, so this was often used to paint the face a very, very deep white, um, but it was very toxic due to the high proportions of lead that could be absorbed through the skin. Um, on the next slide, um, we have um, vermilion. Um, which is another common beauty product that was used to achieve a very rosy glow to the cheek. You can see on this portrait here, it's quite an intense red glow. Um, this too, though, could be toxic when it was mixed with paint. So on this quote that I have on this slide here, um, we can see that um, women could lose their teeth or could excessively drool um, or have a stinking breath um, when using this product. Um, so for women to use these cosmetics and to use these products, despite the dangers that were involved, we know something's been at stake for these women. Um, OK, so if we move on to the next slide, we're going to now think about beauty in the early modern Iberian Atlantic. So we're thinking about Spain and we're thinking about Latin America as um in 1492, Spain colonised the New World and took over um, a lot of the indigenous populations there and enforced their own rule. So what was the beauty standard in early modern Spain and Latin America? How did women achieve it and what methods or cosmetics did they use to try and achieve this look? So I'd say one thing that's really important and unique about Spain in this period is it has a status of being the first truly global empire due to its new territory that it colonized over in Latin America. And what this actually meant was that women suddenly had a very big unprecedented access to a lot of new fabrics, jewels, foodstuffs, beauty products, and all of these things became a part of their routine. And almost as if it's sort of a status, um, exerting their status by using these products that they suddenly had access to. So the painting that is currently on this slide, um, some people may recognise it, is Diego de Velázquez's Las Meninas. Arguably, it's probably one of the most important, notable Spanish paintings of all time, um, and particularly of the Spanish Golden Age. Now, a lot of theory has been done on this painting, and there's a lot of layers to it. Um, but what I am going to do is I'm going to reveal something quite unique that is sat at the very, very centre of this painting and it involves clay eating itself. So if we just look to the very centre of the painting, we've got the Infanta, um, who is right in the centre with the little blonde hair. Um, and we have a lady called Maria Agustina Sarmiento to her left, who is passing her a little um, red ceramic vessel, which you might have to look very closely to see. Um, and this is actually called a bucaro in Spanish. Um, OK, so the next slide, please. So the beauty ideal for early modern Spain was something like this. Um, they encouraged a very, very slim stature with quite minimal breasts. Um, young girls were actually encouraged to strap their breasts with lead plates to try and avoid them growing, um, which you can imagine is quite problematic. Different actually to the rest of Europe in the early modern period, who appreciated a curvier and more healthy body type, some could argue, Spain expected the opposite of their women and they encouraged them to be as slender as possible, almost promoting like a prepubescent body type by encouraging young girls to stop their breasts from growing. They also appreciated a very, very pale complexion um, and a sort of rosy tint and a little blush to the cheeks, which in most paintings of the period we can see on the women. If you see the, the focus here on the three women um, in Las Meninas, you can see they all have quite pale skin and they've all got a little bit of a red um, blushy glow to their skin. Um, they also like to have a little bit of glow on their skin. Um, during my research, um, I found a lot of recipes that involved egg whites um, that gave a little bit of a glow to the skin um, and probably just made them look a little bit healthier. Um, hopefully you can see here as well a little bit more of a zoomed in version. So you can see the little bucaro um, that the Infanta was holding here right in the centre. Um, OK, so the next slide, please. So there were a few key methods that Spanish women used to achieve these ideals. So we've got breastplates, which I've mentioned to stop breasts from growing. They were made of lead. 
bloodletting which was also used for medical purposes um if we think about some of the theories from the early modern period and um, they often thought that an imbalance of humors would have caused um a bad reaction to the body so letting the blood was a way of them to try and remove the illness um, but bloodletting was also used to keep a very pale complexion by some women and um, i found some evidence in literature that attests to that Clay eating, um, carmine was also used on the face, which was a kind of blush. So this was really special because this actually is directly impacted by the New World. So carmine was made from cochineal extract, which is found in the New World. And lots of Spanish women began using that to blush their cheeks. Um, also egg whites being used to give a little bit of a subtle glow to the face. OK, um, next slide, please. Um, so this is what the bucaro looks like. Um, so you can see here, it looks like a bit of a dimpled vessel. Um, we've got one at the top here, one at the bottom. You can see most often they tend to be a sort of red colour. Um, now, one layer of its function or its initial purpose was actually to perfume water, to give it a very pleasant um, aroma and flavour. So what... Um, individuals would have done including women was put their water in their bucaro and it would have given it quite a sort of pleasant smell and a pleasant like taste now what is most interesting is that spanish women didn't tend to use it exclusively for this purpose and um, so if we go on to the next slide i'm just going to read a quite a, a nice quote that attests to this quite strange trend of clay eating so the bucaro was known to have served another more surprising function beyond inflecting water with addictively fragrant flavour. It became something of a fad in 17th century Spanish aristocratic circles for, young, for girls and young women to nibble at the rims of these porous clay vases and slowly to devour them entirely. A chemical consequence of consuming the foreign clay was a dramatic lightening of the skin to an almost ethereal ghostliness. So I think this is quite... Um, interesting to read and this is one of the key basis of one of my chapters of my PhD thesis. When I first came across this I was absolutely mind blown um, to see that not only did women do this but this was absolutely in almost all of the most famous Spanish authors works um, both literary and as paintings as well across the board. It is absolutely everywhere and it is often referenced without much context. So it became very clear in my research that this is something that was very unique to the period and was very understood by the period. Um, so this hasn't been explored enough in the academic world. Um, so there's a really, really great book by um, an art historian called Natasha Sesenia, which is in Spanish, and it's called El Vicio del Barro, which means the vice of clay. Now, my work builds on quite a lot of the work that she's done, um, which works very well at identifying the Bucaros in paintings and some literature. Um, my work builds on that and tries to find more examples of um, clay eating. And I've also interrogated what it might have meant for these women to perform this act as well. Um, so I just think it's absolutely incredible that Spanish women used to do this. So they used to eat chunks of actual pots. I, mean, un I love how Jill has tested out the recipes, but I'm not sure I actually want to try this one myself because um, <laughs> I think I might cause myself some medical problems, um, as I will talk about in a minute. So they nibbled on the chunks of fired clay that they had um, and they repeatedly did so. It was a very, very common custom. So eating like clay in its purest powdered form has actually been part of civilizations for centuries and um, quite early civilizations but eating fired clay so eating the pot itself is quite a different case altogether um, so on the next slide we've got some definitions of what the bucaro was okay now these definitions show how these bucaros um, were associated with women in particular. So if you see here in the English, we've got a bucaro was a type of vase from certain red earth that they bring from Portugal. They say the ladies eat these clays to tone down their colour and the earth of the coffin they eat and consume in the flower of their youth. So we've got a few really interesting things there, which comes from um, Covarrubias' dictionary. So it seems here that women did this trend. They ate the clay. It seems that they did so to tone down their colour, as in to whiten their complexion. 
There's death terminology associated here, which comes across a lot of different texts. So often the men who wrote these definitions, who wrote satirical texts, often valued this trend with death. They said women were trying to make themselves look deathly. They were making themselves look stupid. Men didn't seem to have much of an understanding of this trend. Also, the final bit of the de this definition indicates that women ate this when they were young. They did this when they were young. Now, this is going to become a little bit more apparent in a moment. Um, but one of the main reasons for this is that by eating fired clay, um, women's intestinal systems got very blocked. And it also um, stopped a lot of women's periods. So, of course, when they got to an older age and they were married, um, wanting to have children, this would have had a direct impact on that. Um, We've also got another dic dictionary definition at the bottom here from the Diccionario eh, de la Academia, um, that states that clay can be found in various parts of the world and principally in America. Um, and when it's wet, it gives off a pleasant fragrance. And again, women used to chew and even eat it. Um, so on the next slide for me, please. So early modern Spanish women then ate baked clay and it wasn't powdered and it wasn't pure clay. And it seems that individuals out of this very specific social group were very confused on why they did so. So the first quotation that I've got on this PowerPoint is from a lady called Madame Dalnoy. And what she did was she wrote a travel journal document. Um, she was a French woman of her travels to Spain. And she was very, very um, surprised and um, I guess a little bit intrigued on this custom that Spanish women had. So she says, I've already told you that they had a great fondness for that earth, which ordinarily causes them an opulation. Their stomach and abdomen swell up and become hard as stone and they become yellow as reeds. So it seems here that this French woman who's visited Spain doesn't seem to quite know what this trend is. And this woman in particular, even though it's just one woman who's written this diary from France, doesn't know about this trend and doesn't perform it in her own country. So it seems like this might be a Spanish thing. Um, the two quotations that I've got at the bottom are from a very, very um, interesting satirical text where Juan de Zabaleta um, is mocking um, the men and um, the women, sorry, that are performing this trend. And he says that they must have been eating clay to make themselves look ugly. Um, they must have been trying to undo themselves destroy themselves by eating clay. So again, it seems like men don't really understand why women are doing this trend, which I think is very, very important here, um, that men didn't really understand the logic or why women would attempt to be doing this. If men didn't appreciate the effects of clay eating, the visual aesthetic effects of clay eating, then surely this had to be something about women and themselves. Um, and that is what my research looks at, is this idea that if women are supposedly making themselves ugly in male eyes, then surely this is for other women. And this creates a female self-confessioning community where other women appreciate um, this trend. Um, on the next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about what is called opalation. So what happens when women eat clay in its um, baked format is that it would have done more damage than good to women's bodies. There's a lot of um, cultural examples um, that talk about the state of opalation. So opalation is where the intestinal tracts get blocked um, in women's bodies and most often their period stops as a result of eating too much clay. Now, a really famous example of this. So I mentioned that clay eating does reappear across a lot of very famous texts. So this goes across from authors like Miguel de Cervantes, who wrote Don Quixote, the first novel, um, Luis de Góngora, uh, Quevedo, um, Sor Juan Inés de la Cruz. We've got very, very big names that are mentioning clay eating. Um, Lope de Vega, which is one of the most famous playwrights um, in Spain of the period, um, he wrote more texts than Shakespeare. Um, he wrote a play about a woman faking a state of opulation. Um, the reason is that the often the remedy for a state of opulation and the intestinal blockages was drinking steel water. So I like 
iron infused water and taking a stroll in the sun. So in El Acero de Madrid, which is a play by Lope de Vega, the main character Belisa actually fakes her state of operation and says that she's eaten too much clay so that she can use that as a vehicle to go and meet her lover without her dad knowing because she has to go out and take these walks in the sunshine. So that is a really good excuse for her to go out and meet her lover in secret. Um, so here is actually a picture from one of the welcome manuscripts that I looked at when I did my project here. Um, and I found a lot of medicinal manuscripts that showed um, relief and solutions for operations and how we might go about curing an operated individual. Um, and intriguingly, a lot of them actually did include iron, um, which is what I have seen from the period in the remedy of steel water. Um, so it was really interesting to see the manuscripts backing up some of the literature that I had read. Um, and of course, for this to appear several times, which it does throughout the manuscripts, um, which included recipes, um, which were all in Spanish, shows that this was a concern or a medical condition that needed remedying. Um, clay eating was so widespread and such a big force that, of course, the medical impact of that was that people needed remedies to relieve the bad um, operation that had happened to the body as a result of doing so. Um, on to the next slide. Um, is just a little bit of an extract from one of the um, documents which just details how um, in curing operations um, this had to continue for 30 successive days so it took quite a lot of um, remedying to relieve this state of operation so just to stress that this wouldn't have been an easy thing to solve and um, the taking of iron slag um, so a sort of like powder compilation of iron um, was part of this remedy to, to relieve this, um, this intestinal blockage. Um, so the next slide um, was just to um, speak regarding the triggering of women's periods. So due to the clay stopping women's periods also another concern that i found in the medical manuscripts was that women needed remedies to um trigger their periods once again um just on the next three slides so on the next sort of three slides if we just scroll through those we've got some more evidence of operations here so if you can see the word operation or um obstruction both of those relate to operations themselves um, and these are some of the bits of evidence that I found when I was at Welcome. So on to the very last and final slide, we're going to return to the painting that I showed you when we first moved on to early modern Spain. So Velázquez's majestic Las Maninas. So now that we understand that um, ritual of clay eating, I'm hoping that you see this painting in a completely different light now. So the Infanta set centre stage has a bucaro in her hand, which is an a vase of agency and autonomy for early modern Iberian women and it has a very very special place in Iberian women's cosmetic history and their past. I hope that was enjoyable and thank you very much and um, I will pass over to Patricia to introduce Romana. Wonderful thank you so much Haley. and our final um, talk today is from Romana Samarin. Romana? Hello thank you so much for introducing me and for the invitation. Um, I am going to talk about my project about beauty, art and artifacts. And I would like to uh, talk about long durations today. Um, body care and the virtuous depiction of spaces of beauty, artifacts and bodies merge the realm of art and nature on the body with the mastery of nature as a vehicle for self-definition in the words of historian um, Pamela Smith. Can you hear me well? Yes? Okay. The knowledge and materials involved in self-care were circulated and transformed through time and space. I would like to discuss the connections between early modern beauty, art and artifacts. 
Reflecting on water objects like toilet boxes and ointment jars can tell us about beauty cultures and about the continuities of forms and ideas. Historical beauty cultures typically favored natural beauty and the depiction of flawless and well-colored skin, well balanced between pale and rosy. This was more than a mere topical feature of beauty, rather it was proof of a person's constitution, complexion and character, that is the nature of a person as a whole. Cultures of beauty imply a very broad topic on the level of history alone, ranging from history to visual culture as a whole, from gardening culture and botany, alchemy to medicine and pharmacology, as well as cookery and cosmetics. Cosmetics does not necessarily mean makeup, in the sense of applying paint. Just heard that it also implies eating ingredients. But rather, cosmetics means beautifying physique, as Koller Edith Snook put it, in order to support health, hygiene and fertility. In early modern period, it was part of a culture of healthy living and preventive medicine, including a whole range of early modern medical practices, as well as all kinds of early modern employments with nature, ranging from natural philosophy and natural history to practices of physical activities and self-care artisanal practice and experiments, but also pleasure and fun. It belonged to the material culture of the beautifying practices, including recipes and skincare remedies. Recipes are among the most important sources for beauty studies because they are vehicles for the transmission of knowledge across time and space, as some recipes have a long history from antiquity to the early modern period. They tell us about a lot about historical beauty cultures, such as beauty ideals, whether they had titles, for instance, like to make the face fair or to whiten the face. Recipes can also tell us about health and skin conditions, like pimples and freckles, skin ideals, and whether people preferred a natural look or favored coloring and dyes. At the same time, they encompass both the realm of knowledge and the realm of materiality, both the materiality of human bodies and the materiality of the objects. Recipes can also make gender visible that allow us to ask questions about agency, just to name a few issues. And a lot has been written about recipes in recent years in the fields of history and the history of science alone. The next slide, please. I, however, am interested in the realities surrounding the recipes of beauty cultures and what they can tell us about historical cultures of self-care. As an art historian, I am intrigued by the containers and tools of beauty. The transmission of knowledge and practices is connected to these artifacts, the vessels and tools of beauty cultures. Vessels are also central in aesthetic practices of beauty culture because they contain and display precious ointments, waters and powder. The question is, can we also compare the transmission of recipes and the circulation of beauty artifacts over long periods of time and space? In the sense of art historian Abi Warburg's idea of the collective memories of images, forms and ideas that are transmitted through time and space, is there an afterlife of ancient beauty artifacts as vehicles of beauty practices in the early modern period? And if so, what can we learn from it? Today, I would like to discuss these questions mostly alongside beauty containers. The next slide, please. The beautification of the body, for instance, through painting, is one of the very first expressions of the homo species and goes to the heart of the question of human development. The materials of self-care were often kept in appealing containers such as seashells, which indicates an intrinsic connection between aesthetics and self-care. In ancient, oh, um, the next slide, please. In ancient Egyptian culture, personal hygiene was mandatory for both the living and the dead. For daily practices, as well as sacred reeds, where anointing and healing merged and opened up to the sacred. 
Personal hygiene meant daily washing, ointments and fresh clothing, as well as makeup for the elites. Ointments were so precious in antiquity that they were synonymous with luxury. The next slide, please. Vessels are central to the aesthetic practices of beauty culture. They contain these precious ointments, oils and waters, and open the field of aesthetics, like recipes, to analysis independent of stereotypical ideas of beauty. The ancient Egyptians kept their eye makeup called coal and their scented ointments in tiny glass, stone or faience jars. Countless ointment vessels have been preserved in various qualities as burial objects. The next um, slide, please. The ancient Roman scholar Pliny tells us that scents kept best in alabaster. And the, net, the next slide, please. And uh, the ancient Egyptians kept their precious vessels in decorated caskets, sometimes together with jewelry and mirrors. These boxes were often made of wood and have therefore rarely survived. However, they were also part of essential burial goods, and I show you um, examples. Egyptian medical knowledge was highly appreciated and influential in antiquity, including cosmetic recipes. Egyptian ointments were sought after import goods as well. And, and in the exhibition, um, The Cult of Beauty, Beauty, you can see a 16th century Ethwar Ar Albarello uh, uh, for Egyptian ointments. So it was sought after still in the 16th century. Um, Pliny stated that Egypt has the best climate, climate to produce ointments and Egyptian practices of self-care were echoed in poetry, most prominently in Homer's epic poems. The next slide, please. Homer described the beauty routines of the Greek goddesses Hera and Aphrodite as a sequence of bathing, anointing with fragrant oils, with ambrosia and immortal oil that gives a shimmer, says um, Homer, hairdressing and dressing. And I show a 16th century engraving of the beauty routine of the mythical princess Psyche, who was worshipped like Aphrodite for her beauty and punished by the goddess for that. The engraving shows Psyche's beauty routine assisted by invisible nymphs. Surrounded by magnificent ancient vessels, she takes a bath, does her hair and anoints her body. Finally, in the background to the right, she rests and waits for her lover, Cupid. Homer's body care routine of bathing, ointment and clothing became a reference, even as Greek and Roman authors began to be critical of cosmetics. Ancient medical knowledge was transmitted via Muslim culture into the Western European Middle Ages and the early, early modern period. For example, the Greek physician Galen, who worked in Rome and remained influential in Europe in the Middle Ages through Arabic uh, mediation, famously referred to the now lost compendium of cosmetic recipes of a certain Cleopatra. We do not know whether he was referring to the Ptolemaic queen of Egypt, However, the name Cleopatra has been synonymous with medical authority since ancient times. Historian Montserrat Cabré has traced this reference from Galen through the Arab Arabic tradition to the Latin West. From the 15th century, Cleopatra became associated with beauty and cosmetics. The next slide, please. Giovanni Marinello, uh, author of the popular 16th century collection of recipes, The Ornaments of Women, probably referred to her in the title of his book, taken from the writings of a Greek queen. Jill Burke has published her How to Be a Renaissance Woman about it, and we already heard about it. So, but what about the materials, the containers? In the Middle Ages, Egypt was thought to be a setting for the Old Testament until it became a wonderland of Arcadian wisdom for Renaissance philosophers. 
art historian Brian Curran, in his study of the afterlife of ancient Egypt in early modern Italy, shows how Renaissance culture sought to legitimize itself through the constructions of ancient Egypt. He argues that Renaissance Egyptologists found the continuity of Egypt's history and culture most appealing. This idea had little to do with ancient Egypt, however. The next slide, please. The material reception, res, reception of Egypt in the early modern period is well researched in terms of sculpture and monuments. Renaissance artists had been working with Egyptian art forms such as pyramids and sphinxes since the beginning of the 16th century. However, as far as I know, there has been no research on vessels and containers because Whatever ancient objects were available in the early modern period had already been imported in antiquity. No distinctions was therefore made between Egyptian, Greek and Roman artifacts. The next, vessel, uh, the next slide, please. So can we assume an afterlife of ancient beauty vessels and containers in the early modern period? Um, the next slide, please. There were threads of transmission. We find elaborately decorated containers for luxury commodities from ancient Greece to ancient Rome and Christian Egypt. And um, the next slide, please. From Christian Constantinople to medieval Muslim cultures. The next slide, please. In the medieval West, cosmetics were rediscovered in the 12th century. From the 14th century, caskets were made for non-religious purposes. We do not know exactly how these caskets were used, but it is th thought that they were bridal or love gifts. Um, the next slide, please. Venice was the center of medieval trade and luxury, where goods from East and West came together. In 16th century Venice, specialized boxes for comps and larger boxes for vessels were made. I show an example from the Victoria and Albert Museum. And the next slide, please. Examples from the visual arts show how these boxes were used. As in antiquity, they contained valuables such as precious vessels and tools of beauty. Um, and the next slide, please. However, very, very few boxes that were undoubtedly intended only for cosmetic vessels and tools have survived from the 16th century. And the next slide, please. The Viennese casket is a unique example of a toilet box, as it is still equipped with its contents and we know its history from the 17th century onwards. It was made in Venice in the mid-16th century and entered the Viennese collection through Ferdinand II. The next slide, please. Archduke and governor of Tyrol and one of the most important collectors of art in the 16th century. The inventory of Ferdinand uh, II's estate noted a Venetian toilet box from the possession of Filippina Velsa, his wife, his first wife. Um, and the next slide, please. The inventory noted a tiny coffer with inlaid bone, a silver knot, and with comps, mirrors, and vessels. It was inventorized alongside crystal mirrors and in Indo-Portuguese tortoise shell comps in a cabinet from her hall in Ambras Castle in Tyrol. And this box could be the same toilet box that today is in the Museum Kunstkammer in Vienna. The arabesque decoration on bone and mother of pearl was a Venetian speciality, imitating Persian lacquer works. The toilet box could be worn or hung on a red and gold interwoven silk cord with a tassel. The cord is attached to silver lion masks with rings and the lid can be removed from the top. The, bo bo the box contains instruments for dental and personal hygiene, such as knives, scrapers, kisses, and ear spoons, as well as a brush for applying masks and ointments, a glass flacon for storing precious liquids, double combs made of ivory, and the latest Venetian invention, a flat mirror. 
toilet caskets re represent daily practices of self-care at specific times and incorporate skilled knowledge. Also, uh, perhaps because there are so very few examples to be found, the toilet box must have been a very common piece of equipment. Um, the next slide, please. For instance, we find it hanging from a shelf with vessels on the wall of a bedroom next to a mirror in a wood cup cut of Giovanni Andrea della Croce's manual on neurosurgery in 1573. Um, I hope you can see it on the left next to a mirror hang hanging uh, on the wall. In the next slide, please. Curator Nick Humphrey noted that the French writer and bookseller Gilles Corusé published a humorous poem about the toilet box in his Blason Domestique of 1539. Corose mocked the tradition in Petrarchan literature of describing each part of the beloved woman's body in detail by describing his own love for every part of the house, from the cellar to the garden. The toilet box comes right after the cleaning brush and before the mirror. According to this poem, the toilet box is a marvelous piece of furniture for both men and women. I quote, to dress beautiful hair and also to shape long, fair beards. End of quote. The next slide, please. Towards the end of the 16th century, we find the toilet box as a tool of the putti assisting the graces of the toilet of Venus, following Annibale Caracci's invention of the subject in the Natural Gallery in Washington that I show, and there are other examples. The painting probably refers to the scene in Homer's Odyssey I mentioned above. Homer told us that after Hephaestus exposed Aphrodite and Ares, Aphrodite went to Cyprus, where the graces bathed her and anointed her with immortal oil, such as gleams upon the gods that are forever. And they clothed her in lovely raiment, a wonder to behold. End of, of quote. In the Odyssey, beauty care is both a practice of hygiene and self-care and an aesthetic practice. With the return of the toilet as a practice of care in the 16th century, Karachi draws here on Homer's depiction. On the lower left, the putto has opened a high rectangular toilet box to pull out a comb and a needle and offers them to the grace who is busy with the golden hair of Venus. The skin of the goddess has already been anointed, as its, bright, as its bright glow shows. Incorporating a routine attribution of meaning and an interpretive understanding of artifacts, Karachi shows beauty artifacts as instrument of skilled performances that belong both to the realm of art and the realm of beauty culture. However, there is a problem of transition, transmission. Sorry. Um, that is, the beauty artifacts in museums represent an aesthetic practice that was probably never realized. Instead, they are pieces of luxury made for display. The fragile combs, ear spoons, wires, or cosmetic caskets of the Renaissance have been preserved not as everyday tools, but as precious showpieces. They were preserved because they were not in use. No, they were not in use, never used. Therefore, beauty artifacts may have different lives between practice and aesthetics. I would like to conclude with two examples of the afterlife of the toilet box. The last, uh, the, the next slide, please. In tandem with the practice of the toilet, the toilet casket was eventually integrated into the table as a drawer and developed into the dressing table. And the last slide. The art historian George Didi Übermann states that the question of the afterlife of artifacts, that is a question of memory and imitation of an ideal of the past and not an imitation of a specific object. A continuity of the ideal of the toilet box for the afterlife can be found in the Chinese community of the 21st century in Singapore 
A model toiletry kits made of cardboard depict cosmetic tools such as combs, toothbrushes and talcum powder, now representing practices of hygiene rather than precious substances or artifacts. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, what a fantastic group of presentations. We do have some time remaining for questions. And I'll remind you that um, if you would like to ask a question, you can use the chat function in YouTube um, and the moderator will compile those and make sure that we can see them. Um, and then uh, just a gentle reminder to use that space as respectfully as you can. Um, so while we're waiting for some of those questions to populate in the chat, I thought I'd talk a little bit about what I heard. And I wanted to say, first of all, how much I enjoyed the completeness of this group of presentations, which took us through thinking about the creation of these materials, as well as their consumption and either edibly, like edible consumption or other means of consumption and their afterlives. And it just felt like bringing, um, bringing the discussion full circle. Uh, I also, I was struck by a couple of things. Um, the emphasis across um, period and across um, and across national boundaries uh, on on whiteness and the the creation and preservation of whiteness as a central preoccupation, even as Haley told us, when it doesn't seem to make an impression on the men who are supposedly the audience for it. Um, I also was struck by in Jill's presentation um, the the thinking, the way that it helped me think about the labor involved in the production of these items, sometimes intense manual labor, and of course their marketability related to that, the expenditure of labor in producing them. Uh, and then I was really haunted by the, um, the afterlives of these objects, the fact that they seldom persist, but that there are traces of them everywhere. Um, that they cross national borders, that the um, the emphasis on using, creating these vessels is one that um, we can see in the evolution of everyday household objects. It's just a fascinating. And um, I'll turn now to um, two, two things that are in the chat. Uh, the, first is, the first is a comment um, about the bucaro uh, among the different kinds of vessels that we learned about today. And so this comment is um, that the purpose of the bucaro was also to disrupt the hormonal cycle, uh, a suspend menstruation, and also as an anti, so thus as an anti-contraceptive for weight loss. Uh, and then also, um, psychotropic effects and dependence. <laughs> so I'm wondering if um, Haley O'Kell, if you'll talk to us a little bit about that. Um, and then as a question for the whole panel, there, there's a question about how widespread were commercial cosmetic fabricators in the 17th century? Uh, and I think this is directed especially at Jill because the question asked about the UK or London, but I think it's actually a good question for, for everyone. Okay, so take it away, Haley. Haley. Okay, so I'll talk about the Bukaro comment first. Um, so I want to really thank the individual who um, wrote the comment about the Bukaro. Um, and I think that just attests to how complex of an item and vessel it was. Um, because you're very right, um, I came across those instances in my research as well. Um, but I chose to focus very much on the whiteness for my thesis because that is where I found most of the evidence for what they were being used for. Um, but just to comment on the things that you mentioned, um, I have seen, so I think it's Natasha Sesenya in her book that I mentioned, she does mention about these psychotropic effects of clay and suggests that might be why um, nuns in particular also consumed clay. Um, this trend in particular is very strange because often you would think that religious women would be external to it. Um, but similar to what Jill mentioned about convents being fabricators of cosmetics, they also were key fabricators of the um, of bucaro and making like sort of little clay sweets and things for women to consume. 
Um, so I am I haven't found much additional evidence on these things apart from Natasha Sisenya's comments. I would love to find things and see more. Um, but I can only envision that the that the nuns used the bucaro for the psychotropic effects, maybe to gain like a higher state of state of salvation or meditation or when they're in their sort of religious zone. Um but it's certainly very fascinating. Um, of course, it's going to cause a very like weak state of body as well. Like it's almost got qualities of anemia, um, which is why the iron is such a great remedy for it because it counteracts that loss um, of of that substance that would cause quite a lot of weakness in the body. Um, in terms of the contraception. Um, again, I have seen aspects of this in my research, but I struggled to find clear evidence that any of the women were actually using this as a contraceptive um so i saw the evidence that it was stopping their periods um but there was no clear evidence from what i found thus far there definitely could be evidence that i've not found um i'm sure there is um but i couldn't find any evidence to back that up that it was being used as a contraceptive as such but it's definitely an interesting thing to think about especially as lope de vega uses the bucaro in his play as almost like a sexual vehicle of agency um perhaps it could have a bit of a link there um but yeah i hope that answered your comment thank you uh and and what about this question of um commercial cosmetic fabricators in the 17th century and can we even say kind of commercial cosmetic fabricators is the is the industry that big what are what are we talking about let's start with Jill um so the evidence suggests that there's uh, differences uh, annoyingly for for this answer across different places um and certainly recipe culture in England did Oh wait, Jill, you're muted. Hang on. That's odd. Maybe someone can help us on the back end. All of our presenters are muted. <laughs> I think somebody. There you are. You're back. I think I... Oh, I'm back again. I seem to be yes. unmuted, muted again. I don't know. Um, so, so the problem is there's a lot of different stories in different places. Uh, so there's no one easy answer. Um, and I, my specialism is in Italy, and this is where I've done the work. I've done a little bit of work on Scottish recipes, which again are a little bit different from English ones. Um, there seems to be um, a big focus on domestic recipe making in England as opposed to commercial. Um, other people might know better than me. And there seems to be more commercial um, emphasis in Italy. So in Italy, you get a lot of these women making recipes. And similarly with food, there's a lot more food recipes for domestic use in, in England as well uh, than there is in Italy. Um, so I think that you see probably less of a, of a commercial, um, fewer commercial entities in um, England and Scotland. However, this, as Romana said, and it, the rela relationship between medicine and, and cosmetics is, is, is very intertwined. And so you do get um, people, um, you do get, you know, apothecaries all over Europe making um, and selling goods that we would might consider cosmetic. Um, because a lot of um, beautifying was about altering your humoral system. Um, so it's not just about beauty isn't just connected with what's happening on the outside of the body. It's also connected on what's happening on the inside. And because the skin was thought of as very porous, things like face waters that you could apply on the outside was all, were also thought to affect the um, interior, interior makeup of the body. So both physicians and apothecaries were also making and selling what we think of as cosmetics um, at this time, all over Europe. Thank you, fantastic. I, I think I'm actually gonna skip ahead to the next question because questions are, are queuing up there and I wanna make sure we get, have time to get to all of them. So the, the next question is for Romana. Um, with your study of the vessels, were there any found with traces still present, I think, of cosmetic or other materials in them? Um, yes, um, thank you for that question. Good question. Um, um, 
the the objects I showed from the museums they they are um, clean, and the toilet box from Vienna is I would say sort of brand new. I think they bought it and they put it in the shelf for display. It is so in a, in such a good state. It was never used. No no water, no liquid ever touched that vessel of of Venetian glass. No, nobody ever combed his or her hair or beard with these combs. Um, and the, the, the thing, these, uh, these objects are 500 years old and it, at some point they were cleaned. So no traces as far as I know. Uh, it's another uh, question with the burial goods. There are many traces uh, in, the, in the burial goods, especially the Egyptian ones. And um, there is also a small um, um, cosmetic palette uh, in the welcome um, exhibition on, on, on beauty. Uh, these cosmetic palettes are, uh, are very interesting objects because they are, they are so, they are the oldest ones I think are 5,000 years old. And there's, there are to be found um, traces of, of pigments. They were used to grind um, body colors. We believe that they used it. We, 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 there are no trace, There is no scripture <laughs> they, um, uh, of that period. So we believe they used them, but there are traces of pigments to be found. There are traces of uh, ointments in burial goods. The most famous example, I think, is is um, um, the treasure of Tutankhamun, the famous pharaoh. I think uh, there, there were 360 liters of ointments, of scented ointments, <laughs> in his um, tomb, in his grave. So, I hope That's, I answered your question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a hefty toilet. Um, so, let's go to the next question. Um, this, I think, uh, is probably best uh, directed to Dr. Burke first. So um, I read a recipe from an English Royal College of Physicians manuscript with my class for whitening hands with sparrows dung. Thoughts on this as a whitener? And how would you identify sparrows dung in the first place? Well, um, I have an answer <laughs> for one and not the other. Um, <laughs> There's uh, quite a lot of um, bird dung used in cosmetic recipes, particularly pigeons. They love pigeon dung and um, swallows. Um, and there is evidence that it would have been, would have worked in some ways. Um, I think there's um, still makeup that's created from um, bird dung today. And I can't think of it off the uh, just off the top of my head, but I remember looking at this and because I also thought, oh, that's interesting. Why are they um, so interested in all this, these bird droppings? Um, but I think there is something in it that does have qualities of at least smoothing the skin. Um, it's interesting when um, things like this is are used because that it's cheap um, and it's a reminder that, you know, the poorer women may have been using much more down to earth um, materials and richer women who might be able to use more fancy things to try and whiten their skin. Um, as to how you'd recognize them, I suspect people captured birds much more um, and, and kept them as uh, in cages at home much more than they did today. And sparrows might well be one of the birds that you might ca catch in nets. Um, I don't think they'd be going around, you know, looking at trees and hoping to find sparrow dung. Um, I don't know if people ate sparrows. They didn't in, I can I haven't come across that in Italy, but certainly people ate pigeons a lot, which um, I suspect, and I suspect they, they, they caught, caught them, you know, or, or had them do cots, this kind of thing, um, dove cots uh, in English, in English, English. Um, so yeah, they probably had sparrows, kept them, and they don't think, I don't, I don't know if they ate them. If you come across that, Anybody? <laughs> Seems like not very good eating. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so that, I think that's how. But that's a wonderful place. Uh, that's a wonderful place to stop because we are almost at time. Uh, I just wanted to thank everyone again for um, 
Well, it's been a really incredible exploration of, um, as Romana put it, the sort of um, what's to be discovered between knowledge and materiality, whether that is through the sense of smell or the sense of taste, um, or through the very physical presence of the vessels that held these precious substances that tells us about their function in the past and in the present. So uh, I want to thank everybody for um, their generous time and incredible uh, presentations. And I want to thank our audience um, for listening and for providing such great questions. Have a wonderful day. Um, oh, I have an announcement that I forgot, which is um, that there is a feedback form for you. So uh, if you could tell us about your experience in hearing these presentations, you will find the link for that feedback form in the chat. Uh, also, I want to remind you that there's another event happening this week, and that is a, um, another event with Dr. Burke, Beauty by the Books, Transcribing Early Modern Recipes, the with the welcome collection again, so don't miss that one. Um, and if you haven't had a chance already, make sure you get to see the exhibition, The Cult of Beauty, which explores notions of beauty across time and cultures. And that's it. Have a great day, everybody.